Um, our speaker today is Megan Mansfield. Megan got her bachelor's from MIT and is now a graduate student in the astronomy department at the University of Chicago, working with Jacob Bean on spectroscopic observations of exoplanet atmospheres. She's also going to be applying for jobs in the fall, so if you're looking for a postdoc, pay attention. Um, as a reminder to everyone, please keep yourselves muted during the talk. If you have a clarifying question, you can type it into the chat and then I will read it to Megan. Um, other than that, uh, Megan, the floor is yours if you want to go ahead and share your screen. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me today. Um, I'm actually a grad student in the geophysical sciences department at UChicago, but I am doing my research primarily oh. with Jacob Bean, so it's confusing. So no worries. Yeah, I did it weird. My bad. Um, no, it's no problem. <laughs> um, but yeah, so thanks so much for uh, having me here today. Um, I'm going to be talking today about ultra hot Jupiters and how our observations of the atmospheres of these planets led to their recognition as really their own class of exoplanets. All right, so before I start, I just wanted to motivate a little bit why we want to study these planets' atmospheres. Um, so there's kind of two main areas of questions that we can answer with observations of exoplanet atmospheres. The first is we can observe um, their compositions and use that to kind of understand how they formed and evolved in uh, protoplanetary disks. And then the second thing is we can observe the thermal structures of these planets and use those to get a better understanding of planetary physics and how different physical processes operate in these planets' atmospheres. So of course, if you want to answer these questions on gas giant planets and you want to take a look in the solar system, we have a couple really good examples that you could study. Um, in particular, recently, there's been a lot of really detailed information coming from the Juno mission on Jupiter, like this image that is shown here. And then also there's been a lot of really cool science coming out of the Cassini mission orbiting Saturn. But if you're interested in gas giants and you restrict yourself to the solar system, that's really what you've got. We've got one um, example of planet formation around one star with two gas giants that we got out of that, and that's it. But if you instead open up to the broader sample of exoplanets, we know of thousands of different planets that are orbiting thousands of different stars. So by studying exoplanets, we really can get a much broader idea of how planet formation works in a statistical sense across all of these different um, systems. So here, just to show that a little more, I've plotted all of the exoplanets that we know of so far on this diagram showing their period against their mass. And then for comparison here in red, I've put uh, three solar system planets, the Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn. Um, so you can see that not only do we get this huge, much bigger sample of planets from exoplanet observations, we also can use these observations to probe parts of parameter space in temperature, mass, planet radius, things like that, that we don't have access to in the solar system planets. So there's kind of three main observations that we use to study exoplanet atmospheres. The first is a primary transit, which is when the planet passes in front of the star from our perspective. And in this case, we can see some of the starlight being filtered through the planet's atmosphere. And so we can use that to get a measure of the composition of the atmosphere. The second type is a secondary eclipse, which is when the planet goes behind the star from our perspective. And in this case, we can measure thermal emission from the planet's day side, which lets us find out information on both its composition as well as the thermal structure of the atmosphere. And then finally, there's phase curve observations, which are where we do basically the same thing we're doing in secondary eclipse, where we're measuring thermal emission. But instead of doing it on one hemisphere of the planet, we look at it resolved through a full orbit of the planet around the star. So we can see that emission coming from all of the different sides of the planet. So there are kind of four key questions that we want to answer about exoplanets using these different types of observations. The first one is we want to know what their thermal structures are. The second is we want to know how they transport heat. These first two questions are kind of tied into that, um, trying to develop an understanding of the physics of these planets' atmospheres. We also want to know their compositions and how those compositions might trace their evolution over time. 
And finally, we'd like to know how we can figure out which of these planets could be habitable and ways to look for signs of habitability in the future. Um, so here I've put some citations for work I've done on all of these different topics, uh, but that's uh, too much to fit into one talk. So today I just wanna focus on this first question. What are the thermal structures of these planets? Um, so if you're interested in the thermal structures of these planets, which you can figure out by observing during secondary eclipse, then ultra-hot Jupiters are the best natural laboratories for making those kinds of observations. Um, so here on the right, I've put an equation that shows the um, size of the signal that you get in a secondary eclipse observation, where I've assumed that the planet and the star are both radiating as black bodies. Um, but you don't need to know too much detail about this equation other than to get two things from it. The first is that this signal that you get goes up if your planet is relatively hot compared to your star. So we want to be able to observe hot planets to get this signal larger. And the second is the signal also goes up if the radius of your planet is large compared to the radius of the star. So in order to get the biggest signal possible for these observations, we want our planets to be the biggest, hottest planets we know of. And that's the ultra-hot Jupiters, which I've circled over here in red. So these planets give us a really good way to um, do these observations to understand more about planetary chemistry and physics. So to just kind of outline the stuff I'm going to talk about in this talk, um, first I'm going to go over the first theories for what we expected ultra-hot Jupiters would look like. And then some observations of the first ultra-hot Jupiters, which led us to reassess these theories. Then I'll talk about some new models that take into account our new ideas about how ultra-hot Jupiter atmospheres function. And also a population study using those new models to look at the, um, the Hubble Space Telescope spectra of all of the hottest planets that we've observed. Um, then I'll talk about some future studies we'll be able to do for these planets using the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and particularly, I'll focus on a new method for um, looking at spectroscopic eclipse mapping observations on these planets, which I'll describe what that is later. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about some upcoming studies I'm going to be doing using both HST and ground-based ground telescopes to look at these planets even before James Webb launches. So before I jump right into the observations, I wanted to give you an overview of how we use these observations to actually understand information about these planets' thermal structures. So for most of this talk, I'm gonna be focusing on data that was observed using the Hubble Space Telescope's Wide Field Camera 3 instrument. Um, the reason is that that's kind of been the premier instrument for these types of exoplanet observations for the last decade. Um, so most of the data I'm discussing are going to be in this, um, using this instrument. And so I'll focus this whole discussion around the bandpass this instrument covers, which is from 1.1 to 1.7 microns. Um, so for exoplanet atmospheres, the main thing that's going on in this bandpass that we care about is there's a water absorption band that's centered right around 1.4 microns. So if you're observing the atmosphere of one of these planets and your planet has water in the atmosphere, then you would see a higher opacity in this 1.4 micron band. And so you would only be able to see a lower pressure or a higher altitude in the atmosphere because you wouldn't be able to probe as deep into the atmosphere. So let's say we were observing a planet that had a temperature pressure profile given by something like this blue line over here, where basically as you go up through the atmosphere, the temperature um, consistently decreases. So in that case, in the water absorption band, you would observe some uh, lower pressure in the atmosphere, like this pressure P2. And then outside that band, you would observe a higher pressure, this pressure P1. So in the water band, you see a lower temperature coming from the planet, so you see less flux. And that would lead to you observing an absorption feature in your secondary eclipse spectrum. On the other hand, uh, let's say your planet had something like this red temperature pressure profile, which at some point has a thermal inversion where the temperature starts to increase again as you go up in the atmosphere, kind of like what we have in the stratosphere on Earth. So in this case, in the water absorption band, we actually see a higher temperature than we see outside of it. And so we would observe an emission feature. Of course, this whole explanation kind of relies on the assumption that you have water in your atmosphere. 
If your planet doesn't have any water in the atmosphere, then across this band pass that we observe at, there's no real significant change in the atmosphere's opacity. So we don't see really different pressures. All of our observations are focused together at around the same pressure. So we would basically observe a featureless black body because um, at almost every wavelength, we're seeing a part of the atmosphere that has a similar temperature. The first theories for what we would see when we looked at these hot Jupiter's atmospheres um, were, came from a paper by Jonathan Fortney in 2008. So this theory predicted that the coolest hot Jupiters would have these, those decreasing temperature pressure profiles leading to absorption features. And then in warmer atmospheres, you would have inverted temperature pressure profiles. The prediction was that this would be because of TIO and VO being in the vapor form in these warmer planets atmospheres. Those molecules could ab absorb incoming stellar radiation in the upper layers of those planets atmospheres. Um, so that would lead to those thermal inversions. So our prediction was that when we observed ultra hot Jupiters, which would be at the warmer end of this temperature scale, we would see big emission features in their spectra resulting from these thermal inversions. So our group conducted a series of three studies on the secondary eclipse spectra of three different ultra hot Jupiters using this instrument to look and see whether we could see any of these emission features in their atmospheres. So the first one, which was led by me, was on the planet Hat P7b. Here I'm plotting the secondary eclipse depth against the wavelength here. So these data points are the spectrum that we got out of those observations. And for the purposes of this talk, the only line you care about on here is the straight line running through these data, which indicates a best fit black body. So you can see they're pretty consistent with that featureless black body like spectrum and they don't really show clear absorption or emission features. Um, th so those two other studies were one on WASP-18b conducted by Jacob Arcangeli. Here again is that data set and it's fairly consistent with this dashed line showing a black body fit. And then the third was on WASP-103b led by Laura Kreidberg. And again, you can see that those data are pretty consistent with this dashed black body line running through the plot. So now we have observations of three of these ultra hot Jupiters where we thought we would see emission features and they all basically look like featureless black bodies. So we kind of had to go back to the drawing board to figure out what could possibly be causing all of our observations to look like black bodies. And what we came up with was uh, two chemical effects that happen on these ultra hot Jupiters that uh, Vivian Parmentier discussed in a paper um, that really cause these featureless spectrum. So the first of these two high temperature effects is that water is dissociating in these planets' atmospheres. They're actually so hot that instead of having water molecules in the upper atmosphere, they dissociate into individual hydrogen and oxygen atoms. And that limits the range of pressures that we're able to probe with these observations. So here I'm showing two different models of WASP-121, which is one of these hot Jupiters, uh, which were made by Vivian Parmentier. Um, the black lines running through these plots show the temperature pressure profiles in these two different models. And then these colored lines running across show the contribution functions at a bunch of different wavelengths, which basically tell you what pressures you're able to probe by observing at that wavelength. So on the right hand side here, this is a model where we've artificially held the water abundance to be constant. And in this case, you can see that at different wavelengths, you're probing different pressures. So you see different temperatures. And so you would get some features out of observing that planet. However, on the left hand side is what we think is actually more realistic for this planet, which is a case where it's having a lot of water dissociation in its atmosphere. So in this case, you can see that those different contribution functions really get squished together in pressure. So if you're not able to observe a wide range of pressures, you don't really see a bunch of different temperatures. And so you mostly observe a featureless black body spectrum. The second reason we think that we see featureless spectra for these planets is that H minus opacity is actually blocking any features we'd be able to see from molecular water. So here I'm showing a plot showing um, opacities as a function of wavelength from a model of WASP-18, which was made by Michael Line. 
Um, the H minus opacity is in orange here, and then the blue line shows the water opacity. And you can see that in this wavelength region we care about for these observations, which is about from one to two microns, um, the H minus has a higher opacity than water. So these featureless spectra come from a combination of two effects. First, um, water is dissociating in these planets' atmospheres, so there's no water for us to see to be able to probe different pressures. And second, even if there was some water still existing in their atmospheres, H minus is making this broadband opacity that blocks out everything else. So that kind of explains why these three spectra we observed all show featureless black bodies. Um, but importantly, not all ultra-hot spectra are uniformly featureless. Here I'm showing one example of WASP-121 by uh, Mikal Evans et al. And this planet shows some muted emission features, even though it's almost as hot as those three planets that I discussed previously. So we really actually still see a surprising diversity in the spectra of these ultra-hot planets. So in order to understand this diversity that we see, um, we developed a new population study of all of these planets, which had two big parts. Uh, the first part was we developed a new suite of models for these planets, which included those high temperature effects, the water dissociation and the H minus opacity. And we also looked at models for a variety of different system parameters. Um, so we could look at how the models change when you vary the parameters of the system. The second thing we did is we collected all of the um, HST secondary eclipse data sets for all of the different planets we've observed and compared them to the new suite of model models. Um, so the first step in this population study was led by Michael Line, who developed all of these models, and then I led the second part. So here I'm showing some of those models that Michael Line developed for this project. Um, so these are all 1D radiative convective equilibrium models. Um, as I said, they include all of those new high temperature effects. And when we include those effects, we can see three different regimes in these models. Uh, so here on the left, I'm showing the temperature pressure profiles from those models. And then on the right hand side are resulting secondary eclipse spectrum. So the first regime we see is that for the coolest models, which are these lines in dark blue here, we see a decreasing temperature pressure profile which gives you, as you would expect, those big absorption features in your secondary eclipse spectrum. Then when we go to intermediate temperatures in these models, like these pink lines, we begin to see thermal inversions in the models. And we also see the emission features which come from those inverted atmospheres in the secondary eclipse spectrum. And then at the highest temperatures given by these yellow lines, we still see strong thermal inversions in the models but because of those high temperature effects, we see flat spectra. So we wanted to come up with a way to kind of quantify those changes in the strength of that primary water absorption feature we're observing at 1.4 microns. So to do that, we developed this HST color metric. Um, so what I did here is took each of those models individually. Um, so here, one of them is shown by the line with the circular points and fit a black body to what we call the out of band regions. Those are shaded in orange here. And they're basically just the parts of our models where we saw um, the smallest impact from water opacity. So these are outside any water absorption bands. So here the best fit black body for this model is this line with the diamond shaped points. And then for each of these models, the color was calculated as the ratio of the flux of that black body in this water absorption band at 1.4 microns to the flux that we see in the model in that water absorption band. So here's what our fiducial model looks like when we put it in that color space. Um, our fiducial model is basically just our model for parameters for your stereotypical hot Jupiter. Um, and here I've plotted the temperature of these models on the y-axis. So again, we can see those three different regimes as we go from the coldest models to the warmest models. So at the coldest temperatures, we see positive colors, which indicate that we're observing absorption features that come from uninverted atmospheres. 
When we go to intermediate temperatures, we see negative colors in these models, which indicate emission features that come from the thermal inversions, which in these models are driven by vaporized TiO and VO being in the atmosphere, as well as other metals at higher temperatures. And then at the highest temperature models, our models are still showing those inverted atmospheres, but the colors converge back to a color of zero, which indicates a featureless black body because of those two high temperature effects. We also looked at models with a bunch of different system parameters to see how that changes um, how we move through this color space with temperature. So we varied the stellar effective temperature, we varied the planet's gravity, its metallicity, its C to O ratio, the amount of internal heating that the planet experiences, and the temperature at which you switch from having condensed to vaporized TiO in the atmosphere. So here I've just pointed out a couple different model tracks so that you can see um, kind of how changing those parameters changes the colors that you observe. Um, but in general, this gray shaded region behind all of these models shows the full span of colors that we got from any of the models we considered. All right, so now we want to know how does our observed population of hot Jupiters compare to these models? Um, so to that end, I reduced and analyzed six secondary eclipse spectra from HST. All of those are shown here, um, and the red lines running through each of these plots indicate black body fits. Um, at the time that we started this project, these were all of the remaining unpublished HST data sets. Uh, since then, a couple of them have been published, and I've listed those citations over here on the right. Um, and in all those cases, my own uh, data reduction is consistent with the published one. So then I combined those six new data reductions with eight results from the literature to give a complete sample of all 14 secondary eclipse spectra that have been observed with HST in this wavelength range. Here I've uh, plotted all of those different data sets sorted in order of increasing day side temperature. And you'll see two lines running through each of those data sets. The solid line is interpolated from our fiducial model and the dashed line running through each data set is a best fit black body. So if you don't see your favorite planet on this plot, um, that's because for the purposes of this study, we limited ourselves to considering uh, data that were observed in the spatial scanning mode with HST. Um, that's because some previous work has shown that it's much easier to robustly subtract out the instrument systematics from the actual planet signal when you're using spatial scanning mode as opposed to stare mode. Um, so we just are looking at the spatial scanning mode data here. So then I used the same method to calculate an HST color for each of these data sets. Uh, so here I'm showing one data set in blue for WASP 43. So I again fit a black body to those out of water band regions and then compared the flux of that black body in this water band to the actual flux that we observe in our data set in that water band. All right, so here's what all of our data look like when we put them on the same color plot and compare them to our models. So again, here the dark gray line running through the middle is our fiducial model, and that gray shaded region is the full span of all of the models that we consider. Then each of these data points that I've plotted on top is a single planet's data set observed with HST, and those are all colored by their equilibrium temperature, and then the ones with boxes around them are my new data reductions. So the first thing that you can see looking at this plot is that generally all of our data fall in the region spanned by our models. This is rather comforting because these models really don't have anything out of the ordinary in them. Um, as I said, they're all in radiative convective equilibrium. They all use equilibrium chemistry. They use a range of C to O ratios that we think is relatively likely given our planet formation models. So it's nice to see that we can explain all of these data sets using pretty standard physics. But that's not quite the whole story here, because even though in general the spread of our data falls in this region spanned by our models, if we look at each model individually, none of them can match our data points at a better than a five sigma significance level. So we're actually seeing a lot more scatter in these data than what we predict from any individual model. So there's a couple things that you could think of that might um, contribute to this scatter. For example, each of these planets has a different gravity and we can change that in our models. Um, each of these planets is also orbiting a star with a different temperature and we can change that as well. 
But we find that changing those parameters really doesn't change what colors we observe at different temperatures very much. Instead, we found that the two parameters that really have a big impact on what color you observe are the planet's metallicity and its C to O ratio. So here I'm showing two more of those color plots um, with the data all in black now. Running through the middle of these plots, each is still the fiducial model in gray, which had a solar metallicity and a solar C to O ratio. And then on either side of that, I've plotted the extremes of those two values that we consider in this grid of models. On the left-hand side, the extreme values of C to O, and on the right-hand side, the extreme values of metallicity. So you can see that changing these two parameters really has a big impact on what colors you observe. And just by varying these two, we can capture pretty much all of the scatter that we see in our data sets. So we think that the most likely explanation for this scatter that we're seeing is a compositional diversity in these planets. This is really exciting because as I said before, we can use the compositions of these planets to get more information about their formation and evolution conditions. So if we're seeing a difference in compositions, that might be indicating a potential diversity in how these planets formed. So just to wrap up this part of the talk, um, I talked about how these ultra-hot Jupiters are influenced by unique high temperature effects, including water dissociation and H minus opacity, which lead to the featureless spectra that we observe for so many of these planets. Um, we developed a new set of models to account for those high temperature effects, and those models show three different regimes. At the coolest temperatures, we see absorption features. Then at intermediate temperatures, we see emission features. And then at the highest temperatures in our models, we see featureless spectra. And then finally, I compared those models to all of the secondary eclipse spectra that we've observed with HST. And we found that while the data generally fall in the region spanned by those models, um, there's a lot of scatter in the data that isn't accounted for in those models, which we think suggests a compositional diversity in these planets' atmospheres. So one of the most exciting upcoming things we'll be able to do for the field of exoplanets is to study some of these planets with the James Webb Space Telescope. This telescope is going to give us uh, ways to learn a lot more about the compositions and thermal structures of these planets' atmospheres. And that's because James Webb is going to let us observe these planets at a much broader wavelength range and a slightly higher resolution than what we've had available with HST so far. So here I've put this diagram uh, that just indicates the wavelength ranges and resolutions of a bunch of different James Webb instruments that we think are going to be useful for observing exoplanet atmospheres. And for comparison here in the corner, I've put the wavelength range and approximate resolution of HST. So there are a couple more instruments that we can use on HST to um, measure these planets' atmospheres than the one that I've discussed so far. But even combining all of those together with HST, we basically have access to a wavelength range between about half a micron and two microns. But with James Webb, we're gonna be able to make observations of these planets all the way from 0.6 microns out to 28 microns. So we're not just gonna be talking about changes in this one water feature over this temperature space. We'll be able to observe a bunch of different absorption features of many more molecules in these planets' atmospheres. So that'll give us a much more detailed way to look at their compositions and also, since we'll be observing all of these different molecules, we'll get a lot more information on the detailed thermal structures of these planets' atmospheres. Um, in the first year of James Webb observations, there are already planned several observations to look at different hot Jupiters. Um, so here I'm plotting that mass period diagram again, and I've just zoomed in on the region where the hot Jupiters are located. And each of these stars indicates a different planet that is already planned to be observed in the first year after James Webb launches. Um, the two in blue here are a proposal that I'm a co-I on. So even in the first year after James Webb launches, we're going to have a really good way to probe the diversity of these planets across a range of temperatures. But James Webb is also going to give us another way to learn about some of these best targets that we're going to be observing in the first year, um, which I want to focus on today, and that's spectroscopic eclipse mapping. So first, I just want to go over what exactly eclipse mapping is. 
Um, so as I said, when you're observing a planet in secondary eclipse, the planet is going behind the star from our perspective. And what you're doing with eclipse mapping is you basically very precisely observe as slices of the planet one by one disappear behind the star, and then very precisely observe as slices of the planet one by one appear on the other side of the star. And then you can combine these observations to make a 2D map of the day side of the planet. This has been done once before using the Spitzer Space Telescope, which basically produced one broadband photometric eclipse map that was taken over a single wavelength band pass um, for one planet. But with James Webb, we're gonna be able to do even more than that. For some of these best targets that we're gonna be looking at with James Webb, for some of these hot Jupiters, we're gonna have the signal necessary to make these maps of the planet's day side, not just at a single wavelength, but at a bunch of different wavelengths. And so since we can probe different pressures with different wavelengths, we're effectively gonna get a 3D map of the day side of those planets in latitude, longitude, and pressure or altitude. But it's not really straightforward to interpret these observations. Um, there's a lot of degeneracy encoded in this information, which is basically due to the fact that what you're actually observing when you look at a secondary eclipse is a flux over time. And what you want to get out of those observations is flux over the surface of your planet in latitude and longitude. So converting from one of those to the other isn't very straightforward. So we wanted to look at how we can best extract the maximum information possible from these observations. This, this question first came up at a workshop a couple of years ago at the University of Michigan. Um, and while we were at that workshop, all of the people that I've pointed out on this photo from the workshop um, kind of came together to discuss ways to solve this problem. And what we came up with was this method that we call the eigenspectrum mapping method, which addresses some of these degeneracies. Um, so here I've put an overview of how this method works, and I'm going to go through each of these steps one by one. But the basic idea of this method is it gives you a way to identify flux patterns across the surface of your planet without making any assumptions um, about that those flux patterns following what you expect from different circulation models. All right, so the first step in this uh, method is that you observe with JWST, you get um, these secondary eclipses. So you basically get flux over time at a bunch of different wavelengths from these observations. So our goal is to take these observations and we wanna look for patterns in flux over the um, observed day side of the planet without assuming that those flux patterns follow what we expect from our circulation models. Um, so the second step in this is that we take those observations at each wavelength and we use the eigencurves method, which was developed by Emily Rauscher, to make a map of the planet's day side at each wavelength. Uh, basically, the way this method works is that we use PCA to make an orthogonal basis of light curves, which are shown in the top row here, and then fit our secondary eclipse observation with those light curves. The reason that we need to do this step is because, as I said before, um, converting between flux over time and flux on the surface of a map is not straightforward. So um, we use this orthogonal basis of light curves to fit our data um, because that ensures that we won't have any degeneracies that you could get from fitting using um, orthogonal maps, which won't be orthogonal in that flux over time space. All right, so from using that eigencurves method, we get basically a map of the planet at every wavelength. And then we stack those maps together to make one 3D spatial spectral map where the three dimensions are latitude, longitude, and wavelength. So now we take our 3D map, we divide it up into a grid of latitude and longitude. And then from each point on that grid, we extract out a spectrum. We then use a k-means clustering algorithm to group those spectra together into regions of the planet that have similar spectra, which we call groups. And then we take the mean of all of the spectra that are in each group and use that as the representative spectrum of that group, which we call an eigenspectrum. So the reason we do this step is because you could imagine, for example, just dividing your planet up into a grid in latitude and longitude 
you extract a spectrum out of each point and then feed all of those spectra into something like a, a atmospheric retrieval code or something to analyze what you're observing. But number one, you'd be feeding a lot of spectra through your retrieval code. And number two, each of those spectra would be um, relatively low signal to noise because you're only using a small portion of the flux that you've actually observed across that planet's hemisphere to make each of those spectra. So they would have big uncertainties and the, therefore you wouldn't really be able to learn a lot of precise information about the atmosphere from those. So by using this clustering algorithm, we're able to decrease the number of spectra that you need to run retrievals on and also decrease the error bars on each of those spectra while still ensuring that you retain information about the variance you see across the planet's map and the different types of spectra, spectral features that you observe. So here's just how this method works in practice. Um, so here I'm showing an example where we input into the planet a map that was basically a gradiated hotspot. So the dashed lines on this center plot show the map that we input. Um, in the very center of the planet's day side, centered at the substellar point, we put in a hot spectrum, which is shown by the hottest dashed line over here on the secondary eclipse depth versus wavelength diagram. And then in concentric circles around that, we paint it on progressively cooler and cooler spectra, which are the rest of the dotted lines over here. So then these maps show what our um, eigenspectrum method output. Um, so the left-hand map here is just the flux over latitude and longitude over the day side of this planet. And then on the middle plot here, the coloring indicates the two groups that our method identified. And then these two solid lines with error bars are the corresponding eigenspectra from each of those groups. So you can see that in general, our method is able to identify large scale gradients in flux over the day side of this planet. And it can also identify the overall shape of the planet map. It um, identifies that there's a central hotspot and that that central hotspot is warmer than the surrounding region. Um, a couple limitations to this method. Um, it's, it doesn't do as well at modeling sharp discontinuities. Um, and also it doesn't do as well at modeling maps that are asymmetric about the substellar point. Um, but we don't really expect these to be a problem because for these hot Jupiters that we're going to be observing, we expect that any realistic maps of their atmospheres wouldn't have really sharp discontinuities. Um, so here I'm just showing two different maps of two different properties from two different circulation models of two different planets. Um, so on the left hand side here is the brightness temperature from a model of WASP-43, which is a cooler hot Jupiter. And then on the right hand side is the water mixing ratio from a model of kelp 20 b which is a warmer hot Jupiter. So you can see in both of these cases, these different properties um, really show smooth, uh, smooth distributions and they don't really show any sharp discontinuities. Um, so we expect that for the hot Jupiters that we're interested in using this eigenspectrum mapping method for, it should be useful for identifying those flux patterns. All right, so just to wrap up this portion of the talk, um, we developed this eigenspectra method in order to extract information from the spectroscopic eclipse maps we're gonna be able to observe with JWST um, without relying on any prior expectations of these flux patterns corresponding to what we get out of any circulation models. Um, we find that this method can generally identify the broad shape of the flux pattern on the map it struggles with discontinuities and asymmetric maps, but we don't expect those to be as prevalent on the hot Jupiters that we'll be using this for. Um, and we think that this method can really be useful in two different ways. Um, so the first is it can be used to identify those large scale gradients and the flux across the surface of these planets. And then it can identify um, the shape of those flux patterns so that then you could go back and maybe use a circulation model or something like that to get a more physical understanding of where those patterns on your map come from. And then the second thing it could be used for is to evaluate what types of patterns in your models would actually be observable. So you could take an output map from a circulation model, feed it through this pipeline, and then at the end you would be able to get out information on what level of precision you would need in your observations to be able to observe the features that you're interested in studying.
All right, so that was a lot of information about some really cool stuff we're going to be able to do with these planets with James Webb. But one important point I want to make about the hot Jupiters is that they're the highest signal to noise objects we have for secondary eclipse spectroscopy. And they're such good targets, in fact, that we don't have to wait for James Webb to learn more about these planets. We can keep studying them with the observatories we have available now, and we can still learn more useful information about them. So one thing in particular that um, we'll be able to do is we can get more precise uh, secondary eclipse spectra with HST for planets over a wide range of temperatures. In particular, it would be really interesting to learn more about planets um, in this intermediate temperature range where we see these models going through this transition from absorption to emission features, but we don't have a lot of high signal to noise spectra. So to that end, um, I'm the PI of a proposal that was accepted for this upcoming HST cycle um, to observe two eclipses of WASP-77, which is shown by these red stars here. So we think that with those two eclipses, we should be able to really precisely measure the thermal structure of this planet's atmosphere. And if we see either absorption or emission features, we should get a precise constraint on its water abundance as well. So for this whole talk so far, I've basically focused on secondary eclipse observations. But I also want to point out that we can learn a lot about the compositional diversity of these planets from complementary transit surveys as well. Um, so I'm the PI of a Gemini Large and Long program, which is going to be observing transit spectra of 12 different planets over the next couple of years. Uh, we're going to be using the IGRINS instrument on Gemini South, which is a high resolution spectrograph that covers a wavelength range from about one and a half to two and a half microns. Um, this is a really good instrument to use for these studies because it's got a high resolution and a broad wavelength range that covers the features of water, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, um, methane, and HCN, which we think for these planets should be all of the primary carbon and oxygen bearing molecules in their atmospheres. So it should give us a, a good way to precisely measure carbon and oxygen abundances in these planets' atmospheres. Um, the planets that are the targets of this survey span 2,000 degrees in temperature, an order of magnitude in mass, and over two orders of magnitude in age. So we'll really get a good idea of how compositions change with these different parameters. Um, we think that this should enable us to detect the major carbon and oxygen bearing molecules in the atmospheres of these planets at at least a three sigma confidence level for all of these different planets, um, which will give us the ability to do two things with this data set. Um, so one is it will help us understand better the mass metallicity trend which is a key prediction that we get from the core accretion theory of formation. Um, so I've put that trend over on this plot on the left. Um, the basic idea is that in the core accretion method of formation, as planets get smaller, their metallicity relative to their host star goes up. We've observed this for the planets in the solar system, which are shown by the black points here. And we've observed a few um, exoplanets that suggest that perhaps we're seeing the same trend in exoplanets. Um, but with the 12 targets from our survey, we're really going to be able to probe the metallicities of planets at a wide range of masses. And so that should give us some good information on what this trend looks like for exoplanets. The second thing we can do with this data set is, as I said, we're going to be observing all of the primary carbon and oxygen bearing molecules in their atmospheres. So that should give us a precise constraint on the C to O ratio in these planets, which, as I mentioned at the beginning, can also give us a way to trace their formation and evolution conditions. So before I end, I just wanted to acknowledge a few people. Um, first, my advisors at UChicago, Jacob Bean, who's in the astronomy department, as well as Edwin Kite, who's in the Geophysical Sciences Department. And then I also want to acknowledge Michael Lyne, Jonathan Fortney, and Vivian Parmentier, who produced all of the hot Jupiter models that I've showed throughout this talk. So just to wrap up everything I talked about in this, um, so first we studied these ultra-hot Jupiters and found that they represent a unique class of exoplanets which are impacted by water dissociation and H minus opacity. Um, then I conducted a population study of hot Jupiter secondary eclipse spectra, and we found that they're generally consistent with our current models, but that the scatter of that data set suggests that we're observing a compositional diversity. Then I talked a little bit about how we'll be able to do spectroscopic eclipse mapping for some of these planets with James Webb. 
and how we can interpret those observations using our new eigen mapping method. And then finally, I talked about my ongoing work with HST and Gemini that should give us ways to understand the atmospheres of these planets even before James Webb. Um, so thanks again for uh, letting me give this talk today, and I'd be happy to take any questions. I'll stop sharing so I can see you all. All right. Thank you, Megan. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, raise your hand in participants or uh, put your question in the Zoom chat. And I see that we already have a couple of questions. First one is from Everett. Well, thank you. Uh, that was an amazing talk. Uh, and I really liked the, uh, the population study. Is That's really a dream of exoplanets. Uh, so I was wondering, if, like, hat P32b, so it looked like almost everything is following this, this trend and predicted by the models, except for hat P32b. And I was wondering if that one, why do you think that one might stick out? Uh, does it have yeah, any unusual properties? Let me pull that up. Um, let me just pull up that bit again. Yeah, so um, here this might be. Well, so I mean, I would be most tempted to explain that as again, just seeing changes in those different, um, like the metallicity and the C to O, like you can see here, especially changing the metallicity, you can really capture both HAT32 and WASP79, which are kind of the outliers on this plot. Um, but both of those are really imprecise data sets. Like you can see how big the error bars are compared to some of these other planets. So I would be cautious of, I don't know, drawing too heavy of a conclusion from those, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right, next question is from Andrew. Andrew, you're muted if you're trying to speak. Yes, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so for the eclipse uh, mapping technique with the Eigen spectra, you mentioned that it works best for symmetric um, mm -hmm. hotspots. So obviously uh, an offset a uh, hot spot is something that can be very interesting for hot Jupiters. So I wonder mm -hmm. if you can comment on why, you know, w whether that could, um, can you detect that the hot spot is off center, but just not characterize the shape as well because of degeneracies or what are the sort yeah. of limitations there? I actually, oh yes, I have a backup slide where I can answer this. Yeah, so we did actually look at that in our paper as well because we were interested in understanding how well we could characterize offset hot spots. Um, so this was just an example where we put a hotspot that was offset in latitude and longitude. Um, and basically what we found is, um, so because of the way we're constructing these maps using that eigencurves method, um, it's really just that the first few eigencurves that are giving us the most information on what this planet map looks like, all of those eigencurves are symmetric around the substellar point because they're actually made from combining spherical harmonics. So the first few are basically something like you know, uh, just a hot spot, and then there's one that's like two different um, like lobes and then like, you know, two lobes in the other direction. So anyway, they're all um, symmetric about the substellar point. Um, so basically what we found is it was able to identify a hot spot, um, but then that also resulted in it identifying this kind of ghost hot spot in like, you know, the opposite location in latitude and longitude. Um, so then you can see over here, we've compared, this was like the input spectrum from that hotspot, and then here's what we got out. So it was able to identify the location of that, and it was able to identify one of the primary features we saw, but there was some mixing in between the spectra, and it like kind of, you know, lumped this region of the background in with the hotspot. Um, so basically, I think it could still be useful in identifying that there is some offset flux pattern, and then you would just have to be very careful in how you interpret that later and, you know, make sure you don't overstate the information you're getting on these planets. Yeah, th thanks. That's interesting. If, if just a quick comment to follow up, it'd be interesting to know if those cases where you know there's a, an, an offset, whether a different set of eigenfunctions could be chosen. Yeah, the reason we did it this way was, um, I mean, we actually, we've started having discussion. Um, we recently submitted this paper and we've been having a discussion with the reviewer on ways to fix this. And we do think that there would be ways to do that. Um, but the best way to do it would be to basically feed in some prior knowledge about what you expect your planet to look like. Like say, I expect there to be one hotspot um, and find where it's located. 
And we really wanted to start out this method with just um, no prior information, pretend you've never seen a model of a hot Jupiter, what does the data look like? And then maybe you could do like a second round of looking through those data with feeding in some of that information and that could give you a more realistic answer. All right, um, Ben, then Daniel, then Mercedes. Go ahead, Ben. Hi, nice talk. Um, I wonder if uh, you mentioned that there are two major factors that um, contribute to the scatter in your uh, water um, strength features. So mm -hmm. uh, one is the metallicity and another one is C2O ratio. I wonder if we can break those degeneracy uh, if we have, uh, once we have a um, phase curve at 3.6 micron, for instance. Yeah, so um, I would say it's, um, well, it's, yeah, it's hard to do that with the data that we have right now. Um, basically, I would advise caution in interpreting what we have now because most of the information that we have on um, carbon in these planets comes from Spitzer, which is broad photometric band passes. So it can give you like, you know, general information, but you're not really getting the shapes of those features. So you can't identify individual features of methane or CO or something in the planet's atmosphere. Um, but that is something that we'll be able to do with James Webb. And we can do that for, with those high resolution observations from the ground, you can detect the individual carbon species. Um, so yeah, you can break that degeneracy with those types of observations. Thanks. All right, Daniel. Hi, Megan, it was a very nice talk. Uh, I had a question about um, abundances on the day side and how they relate to the bulk abundance of the planet. And mm -hmm. in which temperature range is it justified to uh, assume that the day side composition matches the entire bulk composition? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, because so the temperature is going to be changing a lot on some of these planets from the day side to the night side. Um, in terms of like how well you can interpret these as you know, corresponding to uh, abundance over the whole surface of the planet. Um, I'm not too sure. Um, although there have been some studies that have shown that um, these uh, day sides of these ultra hot planets are the most likely to be in chemical equilibrium. Um, so that's at least good news for our equilibrium models. These are the observations that are most likely to truly be in equilibrium so we can actually learn something. Um, but um, I would say that one benefit of using uh, secondary eclipse spectra to study abundances as opposed to transit spectra is you're much less likely to be limited by clouds um, because in transit when you're observing through the limb, um, it's easy to run into issues with cloud opacity. Whereas on the day side where you're observing um, basically light coming straight at you from the center of the day side, um, you have less problems with cloud opacities. Yes, thank you. All right, uh, next question is from Mercedes in the chat. She says, nice talk. Do you take into account stellar activity in the comparative study? We know, for example, that WASP-79 is active and there have been spots observed in other WFC3 data sets. Yeah, um, so for those data sets that I um, do the, my own analysis of, um, the ones that we know that are active, I do do a correction for stellar activity for those. Um, for the other ones, I'm um, pretty much just pulling the spectra from the literature. Um, sorry, where's the chat? Was that? Uh, I'm going to look at the chat so I can make sure I answer all your question. Um, yeah, so I'm just pulling those other ones for the literature. Um, but yeah, for the ones I analyze, I am um, doing a stellar activity correction. All right, uh, next question is also from the chat from Rachel Smolin, who says, really nice talk. How do you choose the number of groups to identify with your k-means method? Um, is it data limited and or where do you see this method going with more detailed data? Yeah, so um, basically what we do is we start with a small number of groups and then um, we basically have a lot of different realizations of this map from different steps in um, fitting this map. We use an MCMC to fit it. Um, so we take a bunch of different realizations of the map, run them all through the k-means clustering, and then we progressively add more and more groups. And then we say the point at which we have too many groups in our map is where um, the groups start getting mixed in different realizations. So if like an individual pixel on our map is sorted into group one in half the realizations and group two in half the realizations, then that means that those two groups are actually too close 
to really be considered um, separate groups by the clustering algorithm. So that's kind of how we pick out how many groups we can identify. Um, and definitely that is related to the precision of the data. Um, so I think that uh, we expect that with the precision we'll be observing these planets with James Webb, um, you really only should be able to get those large scale features out of this. So you could get like two groups, maybe three if you're um, getting really precise data. And um, in general, you would get, um, you know, location of a hotspot or something like that. Um, so this method is really good for those large scale features and not, you know, really small scale detailed stuff. All right. Next question is from Chen Ling. Hello, thank you. That's a very great talk. Uh, uh, you mentioned that the non-detection of the water feature in the secondary uh, eclipse may also due to the H minus. So I'm wondering uh, how does the H minus depends on the temperature and is it included in the population study? Yeah, so the H minus is included in the population study. Um, and uh, I don't have a plot in this talk showing the exact temperature abundance. Um, but if you look at um, Vivian Parmentier's 2018 paper on this. Um, he does have a plot where he actually shows it. Um, it's pretty much um, like the higher temperatures you go to, the more of an impact you have from this H minus. Um, so then at some temperature, it just overwhelms the water opacity. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, are there any final questions? I'm not seeing anything. In that case, I would suggest that we all unmute and thank Megan for an excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you.